All right. Happy Sunday, everybody. Praise God that we're alive and we're breathing and we're well. And um, with these these deaths that have been happening, I say we got a brother-in-law, a sister-in-law, and Rod's mom. Um, I love what Rod said because it's absolutely wonderful because we're we're more or less like we're sad for us, not for them, because they're they're face to face and she she can the place that we only dream about. The place that we long for. They get to be there right now. And he's so faithful like that because when um we were talking about mourning, um my my take on mourning is when, when something happens and then I always um you know, my grandma died here recently, and um, I always hold fast to bless her, those who mourn, for they'll be comforted. Um, when you mourn in a correct and healthy way, you can you can start, to, your, your heart can start to heal. And um, if you try to, like, there's like different, it's kind of weird to explain, but like when you mourn and you're leaning into Jesus, you are he's he's getting a chance to comfort you and he he is the comforter and if you um you know when something happens in somebody's life sometimes they lash out and they they go hard into drinking and drugs and disobedience and well I can't can't pray because I don't want to feel that right now because what's been taken from me is was mine and that's not fair but there's a big difference when you say god I trust you God, I know that your word says that this is where they are, and this is our this is our reward. This is where we're going to be. You've given me the game plan and the map, so God, I just I just thank you that they are in capable hands. And really, it's funny when we mourn; it's like they're up there going, "Like what for? Like it's okay. I get over it. I'm, I'm where I'm supposed to be. I'm in a way better place than you can even even think about. You don't even have thoughts for the place that I'm in right now. Praise God for that." Jesus, we just worship you. We thank you. We thank you for everlasting life, and we thank you that it's found in you. God, I thank you that you will speak to our hearts today, God. Every time I'm like at this point in the service, I always feel like I'm unworthy, so it's like, God, don't hold yourself back because of me because I'm just flesh. But you don't view me as that way, God. You view me as special and kind and loving and perfect. So I thank you, God, that that you will speak through me today, that you will speak through your word, that it will not return void, Jesus. There's no one like you, Jesus. Like that worship was saying, nothing and no one. There's nothing and no one like you, Jesus. And if we have placed something or someone in front of you, we just ask you to take them away right now and put yourself at the forefront of our attention. Jesus, you're so worthy. You're so holy. I was just thinking today that uh, when I was in my prayer, and um, I was thinking about the Holy Spirit, and um, I just heard God whisper, like, in my heart, he's holy. And I just really felt something on that to to respect. That. Like, the Holy Spirit's holy? No way. <laughs> yeah, the Holy Spirit's holy. So I had a, I guess the way I always start these is uh, tell you about my week. I had a rough week. It was just full of just absolute garbage and problems and uh, uncommitted people and just like in, in my in my work area, that is, you know, you try to get somebody to show up, you're on a deadline. It's just, it just really sucks to have a, a stressful job. But then um, I remember about um, when I was preaching to always be joyful and, and to like everything. And I was just like, man, oh man. And I had like such a, a super, one of those super heavy weeks where um, if somebody wasn't paying attention to like who they are, who God says there are, I could have easily like slipped into like a depressive state this week to where um, I was late to my, like my Bible reading times. I'd like cut my prayer time short Instead of uh, watching like somebody preach on YouTube, I would like bring up a like a funny fail video or something like that. And I just I just got to notice throughout the week that I was starting to feel heavy and depressed, if you were like there was uh, there was an oppression that was on me. 
And that's because God told me he was like, you're starving. He's like, aren't you hungry? Like, how do you not recognize your hunger and your need? Like, why are you confused about why you feel heavy right now? But it was cool because I got to, with my walk with the Lord and how he talks with me, I don't go for weeks and days at a time in that cycle because I know how I'm supposed to feel. And I know that absence of his presence, I'm starving. Absence of his presence, I'm absolutely thirsty. That if I can, I, you know, and like watching funny videos is fun. Like I watch them too. And like there's a time for that. But my priorities, even in like my day to day, he said, you feel heavy and you don't lean on me. <laughs> like you, oh, I just, I need to laugh. That's what I need to do. So then I pull up a funny video or something like that. And really I was like, man, I'm heavy. Jesus, I need you. And it's just like, he can make you laugh. And <laughs> there's like, there's just tons of times where I needed him and he came through. But um, throughout your guys' week, it's just like, um, like for me, like I always say up here, like I struggle with unworthiness like a lot. And it's just because of like um, who I was in the past. And then the old me wants to creep up again if I'm not strong and solid and put him back. He's, he's done. He's dead. He's gone. He can't come back. So if you're ever feeling this oppression and this heaviness, just automatically realize where it is because you could easily be in a funk and keep yourself in that funk for a very, very long time. And then you'll be missing the things that God's trying to tell you. And when we were in worship, um, when they were saying, um, I'm a child of God, yes, I am. Um, I was thinking about that. I had my eyes closed and I just imagined myself because when you listen to these worship musics, they're not... Um, they're not just, like I said before, there's not just like words that we say, they're like, they're declarations that we're like proclaiming and you could take like these worship songs and just pray them, you know? And, um, I was thinking about it and God was just like, are you a child? And in what way are you a child? And, um, it was just like, well, I just declare that, you know, like Mike, uh, Peyton and Allie, they're my stepdaughters, but they acknowledge me as dad. And I, I fulfill these roles, and I'm allowed to um, be that person for him. Um, so when I just declare that I am a child of God, like when I was saying, when you have those 10 rooms in your house, and how many of them do you give? Because if you give them all to him, then he's the protector. So if he's the father, that means he assumes my house bill. He assumes my protection. He assumes my affirmations. He assumes my corrections. And I would not want to give that to anybody other than him. So it was just like, um, I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. I just declare that, like, God, you're the father. You're, you have the keys, the title, the deeds, the full permission to run my life. Because sometimes us as parents and adults and stuff, we just think that we know better and we, we know how to run things. And sometimes we don't just lean on him. We just lean on, on what we know and what we understand. And then when they were doing the lyrics, nothing and no one is like you. I just I could just get stuck on those every day. Nothing and no one's like you. And then um, I wanted to bring up, I was listening to a couple of my past messages. Um, and w for me, the way it seems that when, I, when God wakes me up in the morning and he says, do you love me? Um, and I kept hearing it over and over again in my messages. And then um, when he speaks to me and then just the way I say it, it's like, do you love me? It almost sounds like I'm calling God insecure. Like he needs to, he needs me to acknowledge that I love him. But really that question that, he, and I, I just wanted to clarify this, if anybody ever took it that way, that when he says, do you love me? It's not an insecure thing. It's just like, he's excited for that answer. That's going to come out. Do you still love me? Or is your heart still on board? Cause he knows like that I do love him and he's not insecure and he doesn't need me to say that, but he's like, he's excited to bring it out of me again and excite that love in me. So that's just what I thought. So as we were worshiping, like I got a lot during worship here. It was, it was really fun. Um, we were worshiping on the, the last song. I had a vision and um, this one was like rather strong. And um, in this vision, um, I saw this cloud rolling in. And it had like the lightning in it. And then all of a sudden it was absent of light and it was all dark. So when I noticed it, it flashed and then it started to roll in and it started to go over the city. And um, I saw a bunch of churches and then it would, it would gather over the churches and it would swirl, thicken and set down on the churches. 
and then I see um, several people in these churches, and they're panicking, and they're like, what are we going to do? Um, it was kind of like when COVID happened, you know, and everybody was just like, what are we going to do? We have to close the doors. Do we have to do this? What should we do? And everybody like, and it started to get darker and darker and darker. And you can see in the church, and even if they had their lights on, this cloud was just still darker and darker and darker. And it was it was descending on the churches in America. And I was actually just thinking about Missouri when I was doing it, but I could say America. But it was descending, and people started operating out of fear. And then these were the same people that were standing at the pulpit telling you not to be afraid. And then they were, you know, like, and then they had to have all these these meetings and what should we do and strategize. And they were wasting a lot of time in these meetings. And all the times that they had in these meetings, darkness was descending. Like, they, there was all these politics and these, you know, we have to be on the same page and this, what's best for our church and all that. Um, and it was just, everybody was scattered. It was like Babel. It was just everybody couldn't speak the same language and they were just thrown apart from the church. And then I see our church. And then I see this cloud, same cloud coming. Boom, 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 boom. And it starts to settle. <laughs> and what is so beautiful is I see several key people in this church. And they have that, uh, that, old, that old lamp. And then, you know, you go like this and you turn it and it gets brighter. And I see a lot of us have these lamps in our hand. We don't need a meeting. We know what's coming. And we're prepared for it. Why? Because our oil is full. Why? Because we're pre preparing in prayer. Why? Because we're declaring God's word. Why? Because we said, God, what's your vision and where are we going? We're not just coming here to meet on Sundays. We're not just here because we want to make each other feel better. And, you know, like we're here because we're family and I love seeing you guys. And if, if that's what I got out of church, that'd be cool. But that's not why I'm here. I'm here to minister to God's heart. And I saw that we were ready. And then it does, I don't know if that's like the state that we're in now. I don't think that's the state that we're in right now. I think it's a warning for this church to be ready. And I, and when we've been hearing that too, and then what God um, said to me directly, that this will be coming out of praise and worship, out of prayer and worship. So to be ready when this time's coming, and I think the cloud is already here, and it, it just gets bigger and it gets bigger by day. And some of us can see it in the spirit. This is why we're why, why why we're preparing, why we're doing the things that we're doing. But when it comes, you don't want to be caught without your oil. Like you don't want to be caught without it. I don't want to be found useless in the in the the movement of God. I don't care what role I take in it. I don't care where I'm at. I just want to be in it. So Jesus, I'm just gonna pray over that. So Jesus, I just thank you that we're listening to your heart. God, I just thank you that when you tell us to pray, we pray. When you tell us to say, we say. God, I just thank you for directing this church that when that dark cloud descends, that we won't even notice it because dark can't be where light is. So God, I just thank you that we, we are keeping our bowls full. We're keeping our lamps full so that when that time comes, we don't panic, God, that we have your perfect peace inside of us. And hey, we know what to do. Turn it up and praise him. Turn it up. Worship him. If we have a problem, God, I just, I just pray that we come to you in prayer, God. God, I thank you that division will no longer hit this church. In Jesus' name. I thank you, God, that any problems that arise will be handled correctly, God. That there won't be, I just feel it again, just no division in this church, God. I just break that spirit right now in Jesus' name. I just take authority over this ground we're standing on, and we just declare that nothing and no one will come in the way of your will for this church, Jesus. We just declare that our hearts are yours, and we put them on that altar, God. Where, send me. What do you need us to do, God? I ask you this week to speak directly to our hearts and strategies for this church, God. Help us prepare. Help us prepare for the battle that's coming, Jesus. I just see like some of us are sharpening swords, some of us are, are stacking shields, and some of us are just in constant intercession. And some of us are just constantly worshiping. Jesus, I just thank you for, for preparing the hearts of this church and the direction that we need to go. Good night. I could pray on this forever. I feel so much life on it. 
I thank you, God, that you're excited about this church. Thank you, God, that you're excited about the people in this church. And I thank you, God, that you're excited about the agenda in this church, God. And I thank you that you're placing, that you have placed the desire of our hearts for this church in us, God. That, that the ideas that we come up with aren't our ideas, they're yours, Jesus. So, God, we just say that we just, we just give you the keys and the whole church, and we say, what do you want us to do? Jesus, send me, and we will do it. So, God, I just, I just declare that we are all on the same page, Jesus. And if we're not on the same page, God, reveal it in our hearts and help us get to that point. Help us get to that point on the map where you're pointing, Jesus. I just thank you, God, that you have grouped these people for such a time as this, Jesus that there isn't one person in here that's not supposed to be here. God, I just take away uselessness right now in Jesus' name. I just declare that you are useful. If you don't think you have a place in this church, you do. You're here and you're sitting here. You are useful and you are here for a purpose. So God, I just ask that you unlock that purpose in our heart and that you have your way, Jesus. And I just ask that you help us stand aside when we hear your voice and when you tell us to do what you tell us to do, God, that we say yes with a heart that is burning passion for you, God, that we don't say yes half-heartedly, God, that if we are in this, we are fully in this, and we jump in with both feet, God. So we just declare that we're not on the fence, that we just hop in on your side. Jesus, we worship you. We love you. We thank you for speaking directly to our heart. May it hold. In Jesus' name. <laughs> Yeehaw, huh? <laughs> God is so good. All right, that's it. The Chiefs are playing today against the Bills, so we're going to cut out early. I really don't care about football. It's really cool to live in a place where you have a, a team, though. Like, we have a baseball team and a football team. I just never, like, the Vikings were as close as I ever came to that. And I was a Packers fan, so unfortunately. <laughs> nothing nothing too good. I was in the Farb era, too, so he was good stuff. <sighs> Praise God. All right, I am going to talk about a Bible verse that you guys all know, or should know, or if you ask somebody to name a Bible verse, it's probably one that they do know, and it's in the book of John, chapter 3, verse, woo, Nancy's got it, okay, so let me get out the NLT, too. I'm going to read this out of two different translations. All right, so John 3.16 out of the NLT. You are a blessing. Thank you so much. John 3.16. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only Son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. And if we go over to the Passion, for here is the way God loved the world. He gave his only unique son as a gift. So now everyone who believes in him will never perish, but experience everlasting life. And then in a different version that I read, it said that God was motivated by love. And it's just like, golly, that just grabbed a hold of my heart. And I was just like, oh, God. Let me be motivated by love because there's so many times for God so loved that he gave for God was motive. So motivated that he gave. What would that look like if we were motivated strictly by love? Cause we have a lot of agendas and we have a lot of stuff that we want to see happen and do, but what if we could be motivated by love, love God, love people. And there's a lot of things that motivate me in life, you know? I want to see somebody healed, saved, delivered. I want to um, see somebody who's hungry for God. I want to disciple them. I want to see them grow. I want to see them start praying for people and prophesying. And I want to see all these things. And then when you get into that, that's the things that start motivating you is those things. I want to see them operate in this area. Um, but really, if you just, just only just choose to show up every day and love them, God will just take care of the rest. And then when you see it in them, then you pull it out of them. But I know, like, as a leader, there's an agenda in your head that you have when you're running a group that I want to see these people operating in this, this, and this. And then when you're discipling somebody, um, last time you said you were going to do this, this, and this. How are you doing with it? Oh, they're doing good. Now I'm motivated. Oh, they're doing bad. Now I'm not motivated. No. Why are we doing this? Because God was motivated by love. And if his 
motivation can bring the best gift ever. Sounds like it came from a good place. <laughs> so I want to be motivated in that atmosphere. And what's really good about this is, um, like I think Tim Tebow, he's a football player. Um, he did John 316 on his uh, his face stuff for football. And it was like the most Googled thing that week was people Googling what John 316 was. Dang, geez. People didn't know what that was. And it's like the, 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 the basic, that's the, that's the gospel. That's the start. And then it got me to thinking a little more that in John 316, a lot of people read John 316 and a lot of people preach out of John 316 and a lot of people minister in the streets out of John 316. But why don't they go further? What about 17, 18, and 19? 17 says, God sent his son into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. 17 in uh, Passion says, God did not send his son into the world to judge and condemn the world, but to be its savior and rescue it. So there's a lot of times when you say that God so loved the world that he gave his son for you so that you not perish, but you will experience everlasting life. And also, did you know that he didn't come to judge you and condemn you? Golly, because Jesus has already paid that price. So a lot of people, when they hear this John 3, 16, and God loves you, and then you start getting into your walk with God, when we say 16, we need to come with 17 too, because then we know, therefore, there is no condemnation. Like, God does not condemn you on that. He's Jesus has already paid the price. You know what you need to do? This is Jesus. This is where you are when you're sinning. And to just turn and face him. There's no, I mean, he's, that's what you need to do. It's so simple. Because a lot of times people think that God's this guy upstairs that's just mad at you and don't do this and don't do that. And he's just like, no, hey, look at me. No, don't do that. But here's why. Because I love you. Okay, love me. Love me. Love them. Jesse, are you loving them by doing that? Come on, quit it. Look at me. Look at me. Love them. Like that's what he's doing. Because a lot of these times, then people are in their sin, they will stay in their sin because it's it's that, and I'll, I'll get into that, I think, in James. Yeah, I'll just I'll keep going with it. I won't ramble. Okay, 18 says, There is no judgment against anyone who believes in him, but anyone who does not believe in him has already been judged for not believing in God's one and only Son. Wow. There is no judgment against anyone who believes. Rod, do you believe? No judgment. That's cool, isn't it? And he he judges you. And here's how he judges you. But anyone who does not believe has already been judged. So there's people all going around that have denied Jesus and denied Jesus, and their their judgment is true. The condemnation's in their life, and they live hopelessly, rootlessly. I can't without peace. I cannot fathom a life where I where I live without hope and peace. And then if somebody is denying God and denying God, and all of a sudden they're, they turn back, the prodigal, <laughs> they come and face. Do you think God's like, oh, no, I've already made that judgment? No, there's still time. Do you know somebody with a hard heart that is always consistently trashing God or somebody that is, is just wrapped up in a religious spirit? Like, there's still Time. There's always still time for them to be drawn back and ushered into the kingdom. And if also, if you're viewing somebody in the ways that I just said, I think that you should go and love them. If you, if you view somebody as always trashing God and always bound up in a religious spirit, and then you can find these things wrong about these people, that's because God's revealing it in your heart not to go talk crap about them, but to go and love them and help fix the situation. Because why? If you're thinking these thoughts about that person, to me, that means that you understand that person and you understand where they're coming through and where they're going from. Nineteen says, and the judgment is based on this fact. God's light came into the world, but people loved the darkness more than the light and their actions were evil. All who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it for fear their sins will be exposed. For those who do what is right come to the light so others can see that they are doing what God wants. Okay. 
And then here's what I was going to get into. And judgment is based on the on this fact. God's light came into the world, but people love darkness more than light, for their actions were evil. So when somebody is doing evil, it's like that dark cloud that descends in, right? Like the vision that I had. And all who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it. Why? Because they're because for fear their sins will be exposed. So when somebody is living, this is what a direct picture of this looks like. When somebody is living in sin and living in sin and living in sin. So think about um, maybe you have a son or a daughter or you grew up with a friend and you two experienced Jesus together. You experienced Jesus together and um, they were on fire for him. And then pretty soon there's just these compromises in their life. And compromise and compromise and compromise and compromise and pretty soon they're not going to your group anymore. They're not meeting up with you on Saturday. They're not coming to your church. And what that looks like is a like what the Bible says right here is a very, very real picture of what it looks like for somebody living in sin. Because when I know for in my life, when I was living in sin, I I didn't want to go to that church that Cindy was telling me to go to because I'm afraid of the light. I've been living in darkness so long, and if I go there, it's going to expose everything I've been living in that God has been telling me not to be in. And then there's this pride that just wells up in you because it's like, what if people see? What if they know? Because my big deal when I went to church is, what if I cry? (laughs) Now I'm up here just bawling like a baby all the time. (laughs) But it's just like, like I said, the world didn't give you dignity. The world can't take it away. Like none of them people, none of them people died for me. He did. And if he wants to move in my heart, I want to let him. And if that looks like me on my knees crying, saying, I'm sorry, but all it takes is just one sorry. You don't have to sit there and waller and beg. He just forgave you already. Just put your face to him. I I keep feeling like somebody listening to this message online or somebody in here just has a really big problem with forgiveness. Like you've been forgiven. Stop beating yourself up about it. It happened. It's done. Are you facing him or not? Are you afraid of going back into that light? Because that light will expose everything that you've been struggling with, but you've already known the answer to. You have just been too something to go back to it. Too lazy, too fearful, too shameful, regretful. Get out of the darkness and go into the light. But what's funny is, you don't even really have to go into that light because God meets you where you're at. And think about it this way. There's a dark room, and when you can, no windows, no nothing, completely dark room, you flip on that light switch, it's completely void of darkness. Darkness cannot be where light is. Not possible. And Greg's like, what about the shadows under the chair? <laughs> Easy, Greg. So when when somebody is living in sin like that, and I'm sure we can all relate on some atmosphere, it's so hard, or it felt so hard at first, to just because sometimes we're we're facing the complete opposite way. Sometimes we're only a little bit, and it only takes a little shift to get my heart right back on. But I, if I ever feel myself drifting, I always bring myself back because I don't want to wake up one day and find myself all the way back this way. And that just doesn't happen overnight. So if you feel a heaviness or an oppression or something like that, and you know that there's work that you need to have with God, it sounds so easy to say, just give it to him. Give him your struggles. Give him your hardships, and um, it'll, it'll be it. It'll be done. Mourn over it. He'll comfort you. Let me see if I covered everything there. So with um, with being motivated by love and recognizing God's judgment or his condemnation um, with these things and, and knowing that people that in sin are afraid to come because light will reveal um, what we need to be doing with people who have this revelation is God's not looking um, for spectators. He's looking for doers. He's looking for people who are actively going to participate in in what they're hearing and they're learning and they're feeling from God. So 
and I have in my notes, if you feel sin creeping up in your life, run the other way. Don't just, don't just, well, okay, I'll work on it. No, run the other way. Go straight back. Do what you need to do. Put your head on the ground. Bow low before him and saying, God, I've missed it. Because trust me, a little, all God needs is to put his, his toe into the door. All he needs is just a little bit. And I've been through this in life where I, I just say I compromise with a little bit, but this little, like the mustard seed, like, why don't you think your, your compromise as big as a mustard seed will not lead into a path of destruction if, if the mustard seed can move? Have faith. So he wants doers, doers of his will. Hope that made sense for you guys. Just kind of trying to read it how I understand it. All right, now I'm going to jump to James 1, 12. I love the book of James. There's a time there in Hebrews and James where I, and this is like a really, really good one to read every single day. It's only like five chapters and it's full of just rich stuff. So if God is pulling it on your heart, just be like, hey, this week I'm going to read James like five times. So it's like, you can easily get that done. Okay. James 1.12 says, If your faith remains strong, even while surrounded by life's difficulties, you will continue to experience the untold blessings of God. True happiness comes as you pass the test with faith and receive the victorious crown of life promised to every lover of God. When you are tempted, don't ever say, God is tempting me, for God is incapable of being tempted by evil, and he is never a source of temptation. Instead, it is each person's own desires and thoughts that drag them into evil and lure them away into the darkness. Evil desires give birth to evil actions, and when sin is fully mature, it can murder you. So my friends, don't be fooled by our, our, your own desires. Every gift God freely gives to us is good and perfect. Streaming down from the Father of lights, who shines from the heavens with no hidden shadows or darkness and is never subject to change. God was delighted to give us birth by the truth of his infallible word so that we would fulfill his chosen destiny for us and become the favorite ones out of all of his creation. Wow, wow, and more wow. Let me go to the NLT. I like the way the NLT ends it. One, boom. And I like in the NLT on, on verse 18, it says, He chose to give birth to us by giving us his true word, and we, out of all creation, became his prized possession. Wow. The God who made everything, the one we worship, the one who sets the table for us, the one who blesses us, he looks at me and says, this is my prized possession. And I think I've said this before, but he gave me a vision of me on a piece of artwork. And I just like, you know, I looked real good. And then God just hangs it up and it's in the focal point when you, as soon as you walk into his house, like I'm a picture that you see in his house. And like, if somebody comes over to his house, he's like, Hey, come here. He's like, this is Jesse. He's like, I love Jesse. He's so, he's so cool. Like, and he's so funny. Like, he feels that way, and I'm, I'm his prized possession. And I really, really urge you guys, do you feel that way about God? Are you his prized possession? Yes. Because there's some times where we can just look at ourselves and we're just like, oh, we you know, prefer other people. Or it's like, no, get it. Hold it. You are his prized possession. There's nobody that he loves more than you. And I was, if I was with my friends, I'd follow it up with, except he loves me more. I'm Jesse the Beloved. When he opens his wallet, I'm the first five photos. I'm the background on his screen, on his phone. I'm the biggest artwork. There's a mural of me on his pool. Just the way he feels about me. <laughs> and sometimes that looks like arrogance, right? But actually it's confidence, because I know how he feels about me. He is over the moon. <laughs> All right. Let me break this down for you guys. I think I'm doing really good on time. I'm ahead of my schedule. 
If your faith remains strong, even while surrounded by life's difficulties, you will continue to experience the untold blessings of God. True happiness comes as you pass the test with faith and receive the victorious crown of life promised to every lover of God. Are you a lover of God? The crown is yours. (laughs) It's there. So when you're surrounded by life's difficulties, um, you know, I like to say in in your guys' life, there's just like, this is just a, it's been a season of, of, of try and just, just stuff. And it's when you're surrounded by life difficulties, you will continue to experience the untold blessings of God. Have you continued to experience the untold blessings of God? Yeah. It's just, a, it's a direct testimony of it. When you're, here I go again, preaching about hard times. <laughs> I, just de- I just declare that that's not going to come at me. And if it does, then I get the untold blessings of God. And I still do. So when you're when you're around these life difficulties, you know, there's some people that have more difficulties than others that so it seems, but maybe your difficulty you can handle a lot more than that other person can handle that difficulty. And the amount of difficulty that they're going through is what God can give them to handle. But sometimes life just doesn't seem fair, you know? And it's just like I don't know, like whoever said it was fair. If I mean I'm I'm his favorite, so can't be that fair. That was a joke. All right. When you are tempted, don't ever say God is tempting me. You ever heard somebody say that before? Oh, man, Jesus is really tempting me today. Like, no, he's not. <laughs> he doesn't even have that capability. What is tempting you is your own evil desires. Is a desire that you're, you know, so like when you feel tempted, you know, I used to even say that, you know, oh, God, God's just really been after me. And it's like, yeah, when God's after me, he's saying, hey, do you love me? Are you still focusing on me? Wow, is that an evil desire you feel? Why do you feel that? Because that's like the way he talks to me. He's like, why do you think you feel that desire right now? Like, I don't know. Like, well, you do know. Dig deeper. Oh, how come? And then you just get to just do work with God. It's like, well, and then he's like, he's cool. He like, he asked me like leading questions. So it's kind of like I came up with the, oh yeah, it's because of this. And he goes, yes, you're right. That's it. I love the way God speaks with me. God is tempting me, for God is incapable of being tempted by evil. He is never the source of temptation. Instead, it is he's a person's own desires. And when it says evil desires give birth to evil actions. So like I said, even even just that little bit, if that desire keeps becoming a desire, it's going to become an action. And when that action becomes an action, it'll become death. Because that's where sin focuses, that's what sin leads to is death. Instead, it is each person's own desire and thoughts that drag them into evil and lure them away into the darkness. Evil desire gives birth to evil actions, and when sin is fully mature, it can murder you. Like, ugh. you want to be protected? <laughs> I sure do. And that's why, like, when I read this, I just, you know, when you, like, we pray read it, it's like, God, may every desire in my heart be for you, God. And if there is any desire in my heart that is evil that I keep running back to, God, I just declare that I don't want it and I don't need it and I give it to you and I ask you to have it. Because I I ask you, God, to protect me because I do not want to be murdered by my sin. And that's why I say, God, just help me because I'm just flesh. And he says, you're more than that. And I love uh, every gift God freely gives to us is good and perfect. And, um, you know, I'm just thinking about when, when he gives the gift and then there's that in the Bible, I think it's in Romans where it's like without repentance, like he, he will give you this gift and you will operate in it. And then when he gives you this gift, it's, it's for the good, right? So if he gives me, if he gives me a gift to, um, to speak to people, um, how am I going to use that gift? Am I going to use, cause I used to use it to manipulate people because I thought, wow, I'm really good. I'm really charismatic and witty and I would I wouldn't um do that in the church I'd do it you know dealing drugs and stuff like that but like that's how I that's how I would use one of my gifts and then all my life I've I've gotten these like you know like I can I, I see something like today or um, this week we were going I went to go pick up some material he says I only needed 10 bags of this uh stucco mix and he goes nope we're all out and I said well could you go check for me he goes yeah sure I can go check and I was talking with the receptionist lady and she was having like a blood pressure problem. So I was just intentional about, you know, hey, how's your blood blood pressure? How's your husband? You know, I just kind of remember things because I'm kind of ministering to this lady. 
And then she says, well, I'm looking at inventory and it shows that we don't, don't have zero. And then in my head, I'm like, well, maybe he'll come back with like eight. And then she started laughing. Guess how many of the guy came back with? Eight. I mean, she was like, how'd you know? And I'm like, wow, praise God. I was just like kind of kidding. But it was just like, it was a moment where I hear his voice and I spoke it and it was so it was just, it was beautiful. And then she kind of, she was kind of like, whoa. And I'm like, isn't that crazy? Didn't I say eight bags? And um, I could have used that opportunity to point to me, right? But I say, praise God. You know, and I got an opportunity to tell her, sometimes God tells me things like that, even if it's in the little stuff. Because if they didn't have these eight bags, I would have had to go like 45 minutes that way and then 25 minutes that way all while my guys are waiting for material because they didn't tell me they were out. So it's kind of like a stressful situation, but instead of the stress, I'm just like, you know, maybe he'll give eight. But with that being said, like um, when I was thinking about God giving gifts and stuff, and it's like to prophesy or um, intercession, there's just like, there's just certain things that God can give you. And he gave me, um, and this, I'm just going to, I wasn't going to share this, but it's kind of coming up in my mind right now. I don't have exactly a huge hold on it, but um, say what God gives you a gift and he showed me a picture of a hammer and um, you know, like when, when God started giving me visions, nobody really like told me how to steward that, you know, nobody told me that, Hey, don't just go out and say everything that you, that you see in your head. Cause sometimes I'm giving it to you to pray and stuff like that. So I had a vision of a guy getting a hammer and then there, he has a nail and then he has to figure out how to boom, 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 boom. And he only learns how to use that hammer because he's listening to God and God's saying, okay, now make sure your fingers out of the way. Okay. You got it. All right, hold it firm. Now, when you hit it, you know, he's just like, he's, he's explaining it and he's loving and he's tender. And then when you, when that guy starts missing and doing a bad job at it, do you think God reaches down and he takes away that hammer and he goes, no, you're not yet. Boom. And he puts it down. He lets you figure it out. And then you can only figure out how to use this hammer. You can only figure out how to use this gift. You can only figure out how and what your purpose is in life. If you, if you lean into God and listen to him, God, how do I use this? How do I use this? And this got brought up because I know this lady that, um, has a a deliverance gift and she, she uses this, um, deliverance gift as how, you know, I don't want to talk bad about anybody, but I just, I just don't see her using this gift. Right. And I mean, it's kind of showy and stuff like, and deliverance is a weird thing to get into. So like if you're in deliverance, you're in deliverance and it's, it, you're, it's it's a really cool thing. But um, I just got thinking about it, and I was just like, God gave her this gift, and I can sit here and criticize her and stuff like that. But, and you know, and there's it's just a big deal in ministry when somebody's using their gift bat, wrong and in front of people and distracting and stuff like that. And us as leaders, we need to grab a hold of that and have a loving conversation with that person. But it's just like God's just not going to take that gift away from her. Like he gave it to her. And she, there's a purpose for that gift. But now there needs to be somebody that can, since she's not listening to God on how to use the hammer, they send people like us, come alongside of them and love them. And my first reaction is to just be like, you're done, get out, go. Like, that's not fun. That's not cool. You're, you're doing some bad stuff. And then that's how, you know, people get church hurt because leaders that go after it. You know, I mean, yeah, if something's hurting your church, by all means, cut it off at the head and and set them there, you know what I mean? But like in something in this scenario, um, it's still at a point to where it can be, it can be taken control of, but also we got to realize that God did give her that gift and she just is not knowing how to use it. So what we can do is we can lovingly come alongside of her and help her instead of criticize her. So that was just like a a thing that was kind of like going through my heart this past two weeks is how do you, how do you come alongside somebody who has a gift that's not, fully operating and functioning in that. And if they are, they're, they're fully operating and functioning, but they're doing it in the wrong way. So that's why when I was preaching a bunch and I was going places, um, God pulled me off the road. And I've shared that story before where my pastor's like, I want you to learn some leadership. I want you to come and take over this youth group. And I want you to, to do this kind of thing. But if I would have said no and not listen to God and not listen to somebody that was loving and discipling me, I would probably not be living for Jesus right now because pride would have gotten a hold of me and manipulation would have sunk back in and I would have fallen because I wasn't ready. I didn't have leadership principles. I didn't have this. I didn't have that. And that's the same kind of thing I see with this lady that I'm talking about. She needs somebody like Pastor Jeff that came alongside me and said, hey, I'm off the road. 
I can I can see some things in you that that aren't where they're supposed to be. You're still doing a really good job, and you're still going to be able to use your gift. But let me help you hone in on it. So it's just two different two different things, and that's why like you know people get church hurt and stuff like that because their leaders don't. And this is for a specific area. There are some areas where you should just be done, but the Bible tells you specifically how to do it. I think it's like come to them if not come with them in front of a brother then the next one is not very fun all right okay sorry i'm gonna read my notes here real quick okay I want to talk a little bit about prayer. Wow, this is crazy. So I wrote in my notes, uh, prayer and worship is so important. There is a movement coming to this church, and it's going to be strengthened by prayer and worship. And that was like um, the vision that I just had in worship, too. And I I wrote this down like a week ago, like three days ago. And I feel something, and we have to be ready. And I think that... um, what's really cool and I, I wasn't here my kids were sick last week but um your message was um was in there and how adamant that um rod's been about like hey we need people we need people to come here we need people to participate in this prayer because um if you know an intercessor which is my wife they never stop praying like she this lady is always praying always praying always praying and when she dreams it's just so real and like <laughs> you look through our text messages. She's like, I had a dream, and then I had a. I told you this before, but I'm just like, like I almost don't want to hear it because it's, it's real. And sometimes it's of, of bad stuff coming, and sometimes it's good stuff coming. But either way, I just kind of sometimes I just want to be like, God gave you that dream. <laughs> I can, but I'm God's given me the ability to interpret. So that's cool that He gives me a wife that that dreams and stuff like that. But with this, with this movement coming in our church. um, it has to be strengthened in prayer. And um, I used to think of intercession as for those people uh, because I was the person that was, you know, my wife says, this is for him and that's for me. Like her leading a, her leading a prayer thing is her thing and, and me getting up here and talking to people is my thing. Um, and I used to think that that was that. Was that. And um, the longer that I've been married to an intercessor, the more I see that... Um, I'm like absolutely protected because my wife will lay hands on me while I'm sleeping. And there's, there's so much countless time in prayer. Just like, um, my life is a direct thing of discipleship and my wife's prayers. Like she always just loved me and loved me and loved me. And even if I was drinking and dealing drugs, she prayed for me. And that was the only thing that could bust through was all these prayers and prayers and prayers. And they spilled down on me. And then I could, the joy of the Lord could just come over me. And I could be who I am. So in the church that we went to in um, South Dakota, every single Friday night, every Friday night was prayer night. And we had leaders for it. And um, it was really hard when I first started and showed up to prayer because it was like, what do you mean we're going to? Like, it's the same thing. I was like, what do you mean we're going to go to church for two hours? Like, Ugh. And then Cindy's like, I wish it was longer. And I was like, Ugh. And then she like started taking me to prayer and I was just like, Oh my gosh, how am I going to like, how do people even possibly pray for two hours? Like, what does that even look like? And, um, the more I got to do it, um, the more I realized that I absolutely love it and need it in my life because there is an attachment that you're doing when you go there. It's like, you're saying, Hey, corporately we're, we're coming to meet with you, Lord. And we're coming to petition you and to praise you. And and what that's done for my prayer life is just absolutely opened it up to where, um, and if you don't feel like your prayer life is that strong, like sometimes if somebody, um, and if you've never been to a prayer meeting, it's a little different sometimes where um, you have a topic to pray on and you have a direction to go through. And I remember when I first started, I would just zip through my prayers and, and just be done. But there's a, when you go to a prayer meeting, there's a lingering that takes place. There's um, 
there's an attention that you have to pay attention to in the spirit and the way it's going because you're cultivating an atmosphere to where God can move and speak. And if we're anxious about an agenda in our head, like, okay, nobody's saying anything, nobody's, and this may be from a leader's perspective, but also when I'm in a prayer meeting too, I'm like, okay, nobody's saying anything, nobody's saying anything. And I always have something to say. I always have something to pray. And I will just like, even on Bibles and brunch, if nobody wants to say anything, I'll answer all 10 questions. Like, (laughs) give it to me. Um, But there's an attentiveness and a listening and a leaning that happens when you um, devote yourself to prayer. And also that looks like your Bible reading time and your prayer time. What does your prayer time look like in there? Is there silence in there? Is there resting in your prayer time? Or is it, okay, here's my list, zip, 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 checked off. Or do you just simply just go? It just feels so good, just his presence, just to come upon you and rest on you. It's like a heavy blanket. But it's like in your prayer time and in a prayer meeting, you guys need to make room for God to move. And what's coming up in these prayer meetings is you need to make room for God to move. When you come into these prayer meetings, there can't be like no agenda just jesus god what do you have for this church why are you having us meet god because you're having us meet so we're meeting speak to us and he will it'll be i can't wait guys it's gonna be so good this season that we're running into if we can just dig our heels in and really just commit and say we're we're bonded we're together and like i said um like division happens happens in this church happened doesn't happen anymore because we're speaking it right now that the division can no longer come into this church and just i see it just reaching its hands in and trying to pull it apart and in prayer we're going to take these two big knives and cut off those two hands because they can't touch what's not theirs ah man i'm getting angry (laughs) not angry but it's just like i'm getting a little worked up about like i just keep feeling in my heart and and division happened before i came um and I, and I never asked why or anything because I really don't care. I just I just know that this is my family and I love you guys and I'll do everything I can to keep us together. And everything I can isn't very much, <laughs> but he can keep us together. So let's soften our hearts towards each other, guys. If we have a problem, can we first go to love? Can we first go to prayer before we can go off with our, with our flesh? And I think that we're coming into a season to where we could very easily have a choice to make to go this way or that way. And God's saying, go that way. I know he is. And there's several people that know he is. So that's the direction that we're going. And I, and I think that we have, I think we're on board. I just, I just want some, <laughs> God is motivated by love. Are you guys motivated? Like, what motivates you? Let's go. And um, I was thinking about, like, the prayer and stuff like that. And, and actually what's, what's cultivating in this, this church right now, in this movement. And um, I got to thinking about youth group on Wednesdays. And I just get, I just get so, so excited because um, who had the idea to come down here? Who was that for prayer and worship? You? Knew it. Who had the idea to come down here? And this is where on Wednesdays, we do our prayer and worship for youth group. And it's so important that this is happening. It's like it's not by mistake because what's happening in this youth group that I see, I see I see growth, I see beauty, I see a lot, a lot of stuff here that I can't do. Like nothing of it has to do with any of us other than that God is in control. And um, what we're doing is we, we stand right here and we pray. And, you know, what we do when we start is we go with the person to our left. Hey, what do you need prayer for? And then the person to their right will pray for them. So we go around a circle and we just do that. And that's really cool because now we're, we're starting to, um, the vulnerability level's rising and we can start to come to each other with problems that we know that we're going to pray about and see, like, happen. And then when we go to worship, we worship in here. And this is cultivating an atmosphere for Sundays. And I, and I wholeheartedly believe that when we pray in here and when we worship in here, it's like we're filling up a meter. And it's like, it's like we're inviting God's presence, and it's so beautiful. There's only like seven of us in here or something like that, sometimes seven to ten, and, and we could worship all night. Like we, we did our open, we had I think we had a movie, 
that we watched and we said, okay, we're going to go do, and what we don't skip is prayer and worship. No matter what we're doing, we never skip those two things. And it was really funny because we came down here and we started at 6, and then by the time we went upstairs, it was like 7 o'clock. And it was just like, good night. Like, how did all of that time pass when we, like, and it's just what we always do, and it goes by like that because we're cultivating in these kids. And also that's what happens in our leaders too is that we're, we're setting up and we're intentional about setting an atmosphere for our church. So now our youth group is going to start praying for our church and we're going to be intentional about praying for our church. And we're going to set some things in this prayer time and we're going to see God fulfill them. You know, do we need a drummer? Let's pray for that. You know, let's pray and watch God fulfill it. We want uh, more people here, more help, more leaders, more sound. What do we need? We'll pray for it, and then we'll watch God fulfill it. So I'm telling you guys right now, what is it, October or October 16th, you will see a change, and it'll be because of prayer. And our youth are dedicated to this. Every Wednesday, we're going to meet, and we're going to pray, and we're going to see a change happen in this church. And you know what's really cool is it's happening through the youth. (laughs) Come on. Do you like children? It's so good. And um, I'm just so, I just want to dote on these youth kids too because they are wonderful. If you like at Bibles and Brunch, they're there to answer a question. If somebody needs prayer up here, who do you see come forward? Our youth kids are laying that hands, man. And I'm just like, just makes me feel like God feels just so proud and it's all him you know there's nothing that that we ever do different like when I um came on to the youth group there was all these you know we're gonna do this we're gonna do that we're gonna do this and this and that and it's really funny that we just none of that was important anymore but what was important was just sitting down and listening to God and then once we've developed that atmosphere then we can go through what God is telling us to do. Then we can structure it how God's telling us to structure. But what he's telling us to do right now in this season is to love the kids because Harrisonville will be won by the youth of Harrisonville, not by the adults. (laughs) The youth will bring in the youth. And when us as adults can look at a youth kid, and I'm not saying that they're any, any different, the Holy Spirit's still the same. It's not bigger or smaller, but for some reason when adults see a kid getting touched by God and and doing what God said to do and laying hands and then um, you know you just hear stuff and testimonies in their life it's just like wow and it's like adults are like really impressed by that but what's really funny is those adults should be doing the same thing it's not just like for that like if you like if anything in this church guys I want them to provoke you onto more intimacy with the Lord I want them to provoke you to pray for people. I want them to provoke you to reach out and be nice to somebody. Hey, how are you? First time here? Welcome. Like, that's that's the way we're going to be getting with these youth, and they're going to be, they are leaders in our church. You know, there's there's the elders and stuff, and there's the leadership team, but I'm telling you, kids, we, we, guys, we're, we're molding these kids into leaders for the next generation. And actually, if it's the same Holy Spirit, why couldn't, if a kid is overcome by the power and love of God, that why couldn't they be up here? You know what I'm saying? Like, is there an age limit for up here? Is this like the presidency? Like, I can full well seeing youth on fire for God. And um, me and Greg were talking about this too, but I just feel in my heart that um, there's that media room upstairs, and we're going to put it to good use because there's going to be these testimonies that come out of these kids' life, and I want to record it. And I want, you know, I want to say, hey, you know, Aaron, uh, like, say we're sitting up here, hey, Aaron, what happened? Can you, can you tell everybody what happened? Oh, well, I was walking down in school and da-da-da and shares a testimony of somebody getting healed. You know what I mean? Imagine five years of those. Imagine the dialogue of testimonies that we have that we can just reach back on and look on and say, remember when? And then we can, like, if Aaron's having a hard time, we can pull up Aaron's file. Let's see all this. Let's go over all the testimonies that you used to that you you were walking through. You know what I mean? So there's just like so much so much life that I feel on that youth group, and there's so much stuff that is going to happen. And then that got me to thinking that'd be really cool if we had like that media thing for everybody, because like there's so many times that I wish I wish 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 that um, like six years ago 
I would have just taken out my phone and I wouldn't have been like shy about it. And I would have been like, all right, Jesse, remember this testimony. You were at the gas station. Guy had a thing on, couldn't walk, you know I mean? And then if I could just go through, I mean, I would have just tons and tons and tons of testimonies. And there's so many testimonies that I forgot that could spur me on. And sometimes when you're feeling worthless or unworthy or whatever, you, you, your thoughts doesn't go to all those good things you did with God. Those thoughts go to all these things that are making you feel that way. But if I could just get an avenue to where we could, and then you know what, we could even have, yeah, we'll talk about it all later, but that'd be cool to have like a database where the church could pull to, to get the edified and build up and hear a testimony. Because I know you guys have some sick testimonies that and you guys have been living longer than me. And I would love to hear testimonies that you have either forgotten about or you haven't told anybody about, but wouldn't that be really cool if we could just have an app where we could just swipe testimonies of, of God's goodness. It would really encourage people and strengthen them. And then I brought up age again. I did that last time. I shouldn't. <laughs> All right. I'm going to close this out. But if you guys could pray for the youth, pray for them, put them in there. Because there's, uh, there's a strength thing that's going to happen, and there's these bold warriors that are coming out of it. And I'm like, there's like a righteous excitement in me to because I see, I see where God is pointing, and I see that we have the capabilities to get there. And it's like, I'm really excited about it. All right, I'm going to end by declaring a scripture over our church. I was going to make a joke, but Rod's here. I was going to be like, Rod and Nate are gone, so I guess I can <laughs> talk about whatever I want to. Okay, this one's very common. Psalms 91, safe and secure. I just want to declare this over our church. When you abide under the shadow of Shaddai, you are hidden in the strength of God Most High. He's the hope that holds me and the stronghold to shelter me. The only God for me and my great confidence. He will rescue you from every hidden trap of the enemy, and he will protect you from false accusations and, ed and any deadly curse. His massive arms are wrapped around you, protecting you. You can run under his covering of majesty and hide his arms of faithfulness are a shield keeping you from harm. You will never worry about an attack of demonic forces at night, nor have to fear a spirit of darkness coming against you. Don't fear a thing. Whether by night or by day, demonic danger will not trouble you, nor will the powers of evil be launched against you, even in a time of disaster. With thousands and thousands being killed, you will remain unscathed and unharmed. You will be a spectator as the wicked perish in judgment, for they will be paid back for what they have done. When we live our lives within the shadow of God Most High, our secret hiding place, we will always be shielded from harm. How then could evil prevail against us or disease infect us? God sends in angels with special orders to protect you wherever you go, defending you from all harm. If you walk into a trap, they'll be there for you and keep you from stumbling. You will even walk unharmed among the fiercest powers of darkness, trampling every one of them beneath your feet. For here is what the Lord has spoken to me. Because you loved me, delighted in me, and have been loyal to my name, I will greatly protect you. I will answer your cry for help every time you pray. And you will feel my presence in your time of trouble. I will deliver you and bring you honor. I will satisfy you with a full life and with all that I do for you. And for you will enjoy the fullness of my salvation. Man. I just declare that over this church. And if uh, if you can this week, pray, read Psalms 91 and declare it over our church as well and declare it over yourself and your family.
I love this part. It says, because you loved me, delighted in me, and have been loyal to my name, I will greatly protect you. So God, I just declare that Church at the Rock loves you. They delight in you. And we are loyal to your name. And we thank you, God, that you will protect us. So I'm going to pray. So Father, we just thank you. We worship you. We love you. We love you. We love you. We love you. There is no one like you, none above you or beside you, matchless in every way. The King forever. Glorious and wonderful, beautiful Jesus. We thank you for another opportunity to speak your name and to hear your voice. God, I just ask this week that we feel your presence, that we're attentive to your presence, God, that we can hear and move and go when you say go, God. God, I pray for a quickening of our listening ability to you. Just we hear it and we go, God. I thank you for boldness to rise up in us, God, for, for the softening of our hearts that we aren't to our own agenda, but we're listening to what you have to do, God. So I've had plans for my week, God. I just take them away now, and I say I will build my plans on what you have, God. And I thank you, God, for opportunities that we will get this week to, to put into practice what we're learning, God. I thank you that we don't just sit here and listen, that we're, that we're not spectators of your word, but we are doers of your word, God. So I thank you that when we read our Bible, that we will do and we will go. But I thank you, Jesus, that, that you have instilled this desire in our heart, God. And if we have stumbled off this path and we are not facing you, Jesus, God, I just ask you to bring our hearts to repentance, to come and look at your face and see your beauty and see your grace and your mercy has rested upon. So I thank you, God, for Church at the Rock. I thank you for what you're filling this place with, God. I thank you that you're filling this place with your presence and people of your presence, God. And I thank you that your house is built on a house of prayer. Thank you that it's built on the solid rock. I thank you, God, that if you don't build it, then we work in vain. So, God, we're just asking you for the blueprints on how to build. And we thank you for just who you are. Just your grace and your mercy is sufficient. So as we go into this prayer time, if you need uh, prayer for anything, um, we'll pray for you. If you need to just get some work done with God, you can just sit in your chair, you can linger. This time, there's no right or, right or wrong way to do this time, but if you have to leave, feel free to be dismissed. Um, but there's no right or wrong way to do ministry time. If you feel like you need to sit in your seat, you feel like you need to get in your knees, you feel like you need to lay down, you feel like you need to dance, have freedom to do that. And this is a place where you have freedom to do that because we're already just focused on him. We're not focused on you during this time. So Jesus, we worship you and we love you and we ask you to move on our hearts again.